From his days with all-time sports talker Dan Patrick to mornings on CBS Sports Radio, Lower Merion native Andrew Perloff keeps the faith. There's something cool about being a Philly sports fan. I work in New York. I live in New York. I've been here a while now. I grew up in Philadelphia. They won't admit it. They're intimidated by Philly fans. Andrew Perloff, who talks sports for a living, talks with us next on Fresh 24. Perloff. Let's get right to McLovin, bro. The nickname. Right. Love it or hate it. What do you think? I I used to love it. I don't hate it, but it's time to move on. It's time to move on, Mark. I've been stuck with it for 20 years because Dan thought I looked like the character from the movie Super Bad Dan Patrick, my former boss. And I said, Dan, what am I going to do with this nickname? I'll always be the second most famous McLovin. And he said, I don't even think you're going to be second, so don't worry about it, <laughs> that, which might be true. But, uh, yeah, I, I felt like I outgrowed it, but these things are not up to me. They're up to the public. And I would guess it's trademarked, copyright or whatever. There are a few of any branding opportunities, right? You're just stuck with it, and that's it. Uh, so I get a lot of people call me. You know in the movie Superbad, he has that fake ID that says McLovin. On McLovin's birthday in the movie, people say, hey, happy birthday. I... I can't do anything. If I do a T-shirt, I owe Judd Apatow money. So it just is not going to work at all. <laughs> He's got plenty of money. Let's not worry about him. All right. We're gonna, you mentioned Dan Patrick. We're going to talk more about that and your road to co-hosting. Mornings on CBS Sports Radio with your good friend Maggie Gray. Of course, we'll talk about Philly sports, Sixers basketball. But first, the big news dropping yesterday, Jason Kelsey retiring from the Eagles, retiring from football in a tearful emotional news conference. Andrew Perloff, your thoughts? Well, I got my hopes up. He shows up sleeveless. Looked like he just came from a workout. <laughs> so the thought crossed my mind. He's working out. Maybe he's coming back. This would be amazing. But then when he started, opened up the mic and started crying before he could talk, I knew it was over. It was an unbelievable retirement press conference. Uh, I just, the fact that he was so emotional, that he was so candid uh, the fact that he was wearing sleeves and not a nice shirt just said so much to me. It couldn't have gone on any other way. It was kind of perfect for who he is. And in that regard, isn't that why we love him to begin with? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If he had had sleeves on, it wouldn't have been Jason Kelsey. Here's a, and I don't think anyone else could have gotten away with that. I can't think of a player who is so genuine and authentic that you don't question anything he does. And Jason's arrived at that point. And of course he wasn't wearing sleeves. I don't even know if he has it. <laughs> and doesn't it figure of the two Kelsey brothers, we get the guy who's the husband, the father, yeah. the offensive lineman grunt, the brother, he catches the touchdowns and he's got the girlfriend, right? I couldn't be any other way. I mean, I don't know how Travis would have done in Philadelphia. I think he's too, uh, He's too polished. Uh, he's a, a different player. We, you know, we've had a lot of good tight ends, but I think we had the right, right Kelsey brother. He was perfect. I think the tush push was a large part piece of him. I think the Super Bowl, uh, you know, the leadership, actually the outstanding offensive line play. Travis might be the best tight end of all time, but you can't knock a Hall of Fame center. You know, every I hear football guys talking about the importance of the center all the time, things you don't see on paper. So I think even football impact, Jason Kelsey's probably a little underrated in the national conversation. I don't think so in Philadelphia, but nationally people say, oh, yeah, he's got all these all pros and pro bowls. He's a Hall of Famer. I think he must have been a key part to everything that's been going on for the last 10 years. Well, and you say that maybe nationally not as appreciated as we appreciated him, but how about all those replays where the analysts will break down, you know, him getting down the field and providing blocks the yeah. centers just don't do? So I think in that regard, there's got to be some appreciation for him, right? Well, yeah. I mean, the, everyone's saying first ballot Hall of Famer. But let's be honest. It's really hard to understand what an offensive lineman does. Travis catches the ball, does an Enzo dance, kisses the pop star. Right. Jason, it's a lot different. Right, I think right. it's hard to see. You're right. There are some clips. 
But let's be honest. Does, is a clip of a center getting downfield as exciting as a guy catching a 40-yard touchdown? No, not, not quite. Maybe the Eagles fans, but the, the other 31 teams, no. All right, Andrew, you're Jason Kelsey's broadcast agent. Where does he go yeah. from here? So it's, I think it's going to be a bidding war. Now, he cannot put on a tie and a suit and go into the studio. I don't know if you've watched a lot of Fox. Gronk is just okay. But Rob Gronkowski should be sleeveless partying on a beach. He yeah. shouldn't be in the studio. And I don't think Kelsey should be. So I would hire him and I would send him out to tailgates, send him out on the road, occasionally bring him in studio. And to me, the, the program, when you think about it, you look at the landscape, who needs a character? Fox has got Gronk. CBS doesn't feel right for him. So Amazon's got Whitworth. He's already an offensive lineman. So ESPN and maybe NBC would be my top two options. ESPN, he could do all sorts of things. He could have a Manning-like show like Eli Goes on the Road. That'd be great. And NBC needs such an influx of grit, of tough guy. These are two, uh, you know, you know, Tony Dungy, Roddy Harris, and Chris Sims. They could use an offensive lineman. I I think he'd be great there, and he would spice up their coverage. I know you love your football, so i got to ask you, what happened to the 10-1 and Eagles? Okay. I've been reading all the theories and hearing all the theories that there was, you know, something with A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts, dot, 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 or that Sirianni lost the locker room because of the way they handled the defense coordinator handoff. I was at the Cowboys-Eagles game, and I saw a secondary that could not cover anybody. I saw Sam Howell throw for 400 yards. I think the defense falling apart first set the tone for everything that happened afterward. So I think it was, I do think there were leadership problems, but I think the defensive holes, losing C.J. Gardner-Johnson, um, losing Hargrave, I think the defensive personnel holes, the 10-1 and one was false. The defense was not good enough, and I think that's when things started, the wheels started turning off. So I don't buy as much into the drama, which I'm sure was there, I do think if they can get the right pieces, they could fix some of that. Because, come on, they couldn't, they couldn't cover anybody. They couldn't tackle in the secondary. I was really disappointed with their safeties and cornerbacks. Mm. Yeah, so much so. They better concentrate on getting some of the draft. Big time. Uh, yeah, Big yeah, time. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to go too deep into that. Listen, we care a lot about sports. I wouldn't have been employed. Uh, you wouldn't be employed if we didn't care so much about sports. Uh, we love it really globally, but in Philly, it's like an obsession. Why is that? I get into this. So I, I work in New York. I live in New York. I've been here a while now. I grew up in Philadelphia. And I'm openly critical of New York fans. I'm like, you guys just don't get it. You don't even really care. <laughs> you have two baseball teams. And you can. So I know guys who root for the Mets and the Yankees. You don't get it. I mean, the honest answer, Mark, I don't think we have anything else going on. <laughs> no. uh, I just think that it's a, a northeastern city with four teams. I never doubted for a second who I was going to root for. So there's no choices. That helps. Uh, there was the occasional kid who liked the Cowboys, Todd Klempner. I couldn't stand him. Oh. Wanted to beat him up all the time. I don't know if you had that guy growing up. But I, I think it's the four sports and the loyalty. And, you know, there's also there's something cool about being a Philly sports fan. I, I can go into a sports bar, and I am not a tough guy. I weigh 195 pounds. I could not say, but I say I'm a Philly sports fan. That, that's the toughest thing about me. Honestly, I, I booed people on my own team for years. So it's like kind of a cool factor, especially when you bring it on the road. Because in New York, they're genuine, they won't admit it. They're intimidated by Phillies fans. Mm. Uh, they, they just do not understand wow. how much we love it. I, I really believe that. Listen, we're going to talk more, as mentioned, about Dan Patrick, about what you're doing now, co-hosting mornings on CBS Sports Radio with Maggie Gray. And, of course, this is a Sixers-centric podcast, so plenty of Sixers talk coming up. But I remember, I remember probably late 80s when WIP went all sports here Hmm. in Philly. And I remember thinking, who's going to listen to sports talk 24 hours a day? And it turns out a ton of people. (laughs) Why is that? Oh, my gosh. So I was one of those people in uh, late 80s, early 90s. I called into WIP. I called into Gary Cobb, who was my first call. Remember, he had a show at night, former Eagles linebacker. I I don't know. I don't know. I originally, you know what my favorite thing when I was a kid, trade talk. I wanted to hear who my team was going to get. They really, Sports Talk Radio came before the internet. You could go on Twitter and say, 
you know, or the Philly's going to move this guy or the Eagles going to move this guy. So it was a first real community where you could actually throw out a trade idea or hear other people's trade ideas. And I, I think it's just interesting, you know, we all have the information. You're not going to break any news to anybody. Something happens, I get it on my phone immediately. Now we need opinion. So where else is there? I think Sports Talk Radio and, and podcasts are taking over that role are very sticky because we love opinion. You know, that is to me one of the most fun things about sports. So I don't think it, you know, that's why I originally got into it. And I don't think it's going anywhere. I think Sports Talk Radio is going to survive AI, <laughs> unlike most industries. Yeah, right. Hey, yeah. Uh, speaking of opinion, what makes a good sports talk host? I would imagine opinion and well-based and well-grounded opinions has to be a large part of that, right? So uh, to me, sort of the top of the mountain of sports talk radio is Dan Patrick, who I worked for for years. I mean, it sounds like uh, I'm kissing his butt. But the thing is, he would have opinion. He'd have a way. That's a great way to put it. He'd have an opinion, but it wasn't a hot take. So to me... He it was informed opinion. He had a lot of sources and he was never saying anything for a headline like and we all know the names of people who do that. So, and, you know, the thing about Dan, too, it's not just the opinions. It's the, the fact that you feel like you can relate to him, like you're talking to a friend about that. So I think it's a combination of opinions and relatability. So there's an authenticity. If someone comes out with an opinion and it feels like they wrote it just to get clicks, then I think most fans can smell that. So I think it's a combination of opinions and authenticity and real passion for what you're talking about. What's it? Uh, what's the deal now with shock value and saying things yep. for clicks and all of that? How do you read into that? What's your feeling on that? And do you participate in any of that? I do. I do at times. Um, so I, I've sort of seen the evolution of this. I was at SI, which is the granddaddy of sports brands for a long time, 2004, on and off to 2014. And they were slow to the opinion game because for, they were all about reporting and storytelling, which is amazing and has been lost to a large degree. But I, I told them, I'm like, you need shorter pieces that are quick opinions people can grab onto. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind in the dust. It is a lowering of attention span. You got to hit people immediately. So the best way to do that is to say something contrary. So again, I, if you do it in an authentic way, I'm interested. I'm definitely interested. I like to hear against the grain ideas. I like to hear contrarian stuff. If you're doing it just for a click, it can be, it can be smelled out. But it's crazy. People have – what are their attention spans? It's really about – you can think of 20 seconds, 40 seconds maybe. Forget 10 minutes. you got to hit them immediately and say, I think the Cleveland Browns should trade for Justin Fields. or, so, or I can't even think about hot there. I think the Eagles should trade Jalen Hurts – a way out of Philadelphia. You got to say something like that to catch people's attention. It's an unfortunate uh, part of this. And I do it. I, I'd be lying. Once in a while, I'll put out a tweet and I'm like, I know this is going to get reaction. Uh, it's simple. I mean, almost the simpler, the better. So mm -hmm. the, the key is to like, I think the key is to try and be authentic when you're doing it. Working in sports, talking for, you know, a career in sports, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk more about that. Your 76ers thoughts, uh, Stephen A. Smith and Pat McAfee, gigantic. And I want you to yep. weigh in on those guys and yep. tell me why they're so big. But now it's halftime. And with halftime, we have a couple of things. First, we have our Garage Beer six-pack of questions. It's brought to you by Garage Beer, beer-flavored beer. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. I'm going to be a choice between two things. You're a Philly guy. Just blurt out the answer. Don't think about it. Just blurt. You ready? Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Philly cheesesteak or Philly soft pretzel? Philly cheesesteak. Center City or South Jersey? Center City. Gritty or Philly fanatic? Philly fanatic. Meek Miller, Hall and Oates. Oh my gosh, Hall and Oates. Dr. J Dr. J or Allen Iverson throwback jersey? Dr. J. Liberty Bell or Rocky Steps? Rocky Steps. The six pack of questions brought to you by Gar Garage Beer, beer flavored beer. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. And it's now time to get into my music library. I will give you a handful of artists from that library, and you tell me if you have them in your library or not. Are you okay. ready? Yes. Frank Sinatra. No. D Death Cab for Cutie. Definitely, yes. John Coltrane. No. Led Zeppelin. 
Yes. Rush. Yes. So I got to turn you on to some classic stuff like Frank Sinatra, Coltrane, great jazz artist, Sinatra, jazz standards, all that. I mean, that's uh, that. that yeah, it's got to be sta- that's got to be standard stuff just to be able to say to your kids, hey, you know what? This guy came, you know, before everybody else, and this is whose shoulders a lot of people stands on. Stand on. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed to say it because. Any age, I think Frank Sinatra is cool. I mean, I'm very aware of him, but to be honest, I have not given it a good listen, and I think I should because we all know the the first few hits. But you're right; I wouldn't mind some recommendations. Let's go deep. Personal history: Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Lower Marion High School, right? Yeah, born in Syracuse, moved here as a kid, grew up in Lower Marion, went to LM High School, and you played ball there, right? Before the late Kobe Bryant, but you did play. I kind of late. I kind of laid down the tracks for it to become an elite state winning program. <laughs> My uh, one point a game as a bench warmer in the late 80s. Uh, I just missed. So I had a coach. Uh, I was in the last year, really, of the old coach. And Greg Downer came right after me. And my brother was on the team with Kobe. But I did play pickup against Kobe at the JCC on City Line Avenue. And, and how did that dunked, go? He dunked. <laughs> nobody dunks in half court. <laughs> 15-year-old Kobe dunked on my head. I, I was aware of who he was. I'm like, I'm going to show this kid some moves. <laughs> and he, he destroyed me. But he was such a nice guy. But uh, when I was playing high school basketball, Joe Bryant was around, interestingly enough. So we were well, well aware of who Kobe was. Yeah, and I remember Jelly Bean as a player, but that's neither, not neither, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, and you actually played a little bit in college, am I right? Yeah, so I played JV at Dartmouth. Um, which, uh, which is funny. It was Lower Marion. We were really good when I, at the end of my uh, career there. It was easier to get time as a JV player in Dartmouth. But I love basketball. Still play pickup into my 50s. Um, yeah, it's, uh, basketball really has been my favorite sport to play forever. Now, you said before we started recording that you and I had a, quote, run in. I hope it wasn't yeah. anything dramatic. or. <laughs> so Tell me what happened. <laughs> you might want to edit this out because it's so silly. I got asked to speak at the synagogue that I was bar mitzvahed at, Mainline Reform. And it was a big honor. I'm like, oh, the hometown boys coming home. It's going to be great. So I speak to a group of about 30 people, mostly men. And the guy, the host goes, that was great. But we had Zoom off three weeks ago. It <laughs> totally sold out. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you had Mark Zoom off before me. So, uh, yeah, they were disappointed that I didn't have the access to the Sixers and everything that you did. So that was kind of disappointing for me. And when was this? This was about five years ago. Okay. And you had you made the jump to Sports Talk by then? Uh, like, yeah. I like as a host. host. Yeah, as yeah. Host. Not as a host. So I was, you know, I sort of, a, I would call myself a sidekick on the Dan Patrick show. But I had sort of started, and I had, I was at SI, I had a little name as a writer. So I was not a, not a host. Uh, everyone knew me as McLovin and not Perloff at that point. Yeah, right. Um, how did you get into sports media business? <sighs> it was the worst mistake of my life. I was accepted to law school. Wait, why, wait, 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 wait. Why would you say that? <laughs> well, so I was accepted to law school, and I was going to go to law school. And I just said, you know what? I don't want to be a lawyer. I had written for the school paper in college and in high school. So a friend of mine was starting a sports, or was part of a startup for a sports website. And I joined him. I'm only saying that because this was the mid nineties and there was a lot more money in a lot more fields besides sports media. So I actually, of course, I've loved what I've done. That was probably an out of place joke. But do you remember by any chance sports fan radio? It was Pete Rose Ha, is syndicated. It was a small company that syndicated Pete Rose and the fabulous Sports Babe, and they yes. started out of Wednesday. Yes. Yes. So Rose had this show, and I was a big Pete Rose fan as a Phillies fan. Uh, so I worked with them. Then I then I sort of jumped around a lot. I worked for FoxSports.com. I worked for the NFL, Sports Illustrated, and then landed with Dan. But my, my I was a I was a print background. I was uh, mostly words. Accidentally fell into the radio stuff. Um, I never planned to be that way. I always thought I'd be an editor, writer type. So that was a bit of an accident to get in front of the mic. You know, it's hard to describe to new schoolers, Sports Illustrated, what it meant to get it weekly, how big it was, to be on the cover, to read some of the great writers. Uh, what becomes of that brand now? Uh, you know, 
it's been really sad. And it's been a few years now where they just have not had that integrity that Sports Illustrated had. They didn't care about what it used to be. Now, what it used to be wasn't sustainable. I was there. Every article you wrote for the magazine, 40 people would work on fact-checking it, and it was just not a sustainable economic model. You know, writers would write three, three stories a year. The great writers, just not feasible. But there was definitely a middle ground that they failed to take advantage of. Where they really failed happened about 10 to 15 years ago. They couldn't turn their Sports Illustrated into a profitable website app. They weren't, they weren't able to adjust to modern times. And that's reality. Like, you really need, you know, I give the ringer a lot of credit. And these people are always willing to try a new platform. Sports Illustrated for a lot of reasons, was not ready to do that. So now they have this problem. There was a, that story that came out about two months ago about everybody getting fired. That was really more of a union busting story. Basically, if you were in the union, they wanted to get rid of you, which is terrible. It's just terrible. I think they salvaged something, but it's never going to be the same. And you're right. Young people have no idea. I got there, and my first job was to edit Dr. Z. Do you remember him? Uh, yeah, sure. Great football, football writer. writer. Sure. And Peter, and Peter King. Yeah. And now Peter recently retired. Uh, yeah, it'll be lost. People will not understand uh, how many great things came out of there. And I got to meet all the swimsuit models. <laughs> <laughs> or they got to meet you. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> hey, um, what's your earliest 76ers memory? Uh, you know, I do remember, I, I mean, the 80s. Uh, I remember vaguely when Magic subbed in game six. Uh, was that 79-80 or 80-81? Uh, uh, it was 1980, the 1980 finals. Yes. I remember very well the Moses Malone championship year. I remember, yeah. So I I was fully invested by now. And it's funny. I, I remember it's that age that you're at. You remember all the players. I remember that team very, very well. And that That is still my all-time favorite Sixers team. And then there were the dark ages until, um, you know, Charles Barkley came along and uh, Allen Iverson more specifically, uh, by the way, he's turning 49. I know Iverson. He's I know been out of the NBA 13 years. If you can encapsulate his legacy and what exactly number three meant to all of us as basketball fans, as Sixers fans. He meant so much more than basketball. He was, uh, you know, I think he came a little bit too early because right now we see social media phenomenons. He was like a social media phenomenon before we had social media. Like everybody just talked about him. Everywhere I was, I was out of Philadelphia at the time and there were Allen Iverson fans everywhere. He was just, uh, it wasn't just the style of play too. It was everything about him was so cool. So to me, it's, it's almost impossible. If you look back at his highlights, it doesn't even do justice to how important he was. And I, it's funny, I work with a young producer. He's about 28 and he, he missed a lot of Iverson, but he's like, that is the definition of cool as a basketball player. Still, I can't believe he's been out of the league 13 years. I know. So to me, it was the whole package with him. Uh, you can't separate the guy, the flash, the attitude. Everything made him who he was, and it was incredible. It's got to be frustrating. In fact, I know it's frustrating because I'm a Sixers fan. The greatness of Joel Embiid mm. and the equal frustration with him not being able to stay healthy. Um, just give me a stream of consciousness reaction yeah. to Joel Embiid. Uh, it's really mean, but I don't understand how he can carry extra weight. It just, I mean, you might be able to explain it to me. I saw Akeem win two titles. He never had an ounce of anything but muscle on him. LeBron puts a million dollars a year into his body. So that I get frustrated that he isn't a hundred percent about fitness. And I worry about it because I also, he falls a lot. So the two things with me, I feel terrible because he's obviously, he's not as a person, he's not overweight, but as an NBA superstar, he's carrying too much weight. And I, I am so cynical. I don't see him ever being healthy through a playoff series. I'm one of those guys and I want him to bring him back this year. You might as well take a shot, but I just like, I'm, I'm really cynical, which I'm not usually as a sports fan, but I just don't think it can happen with him. And it's a waste because he's a, obviously a championship caliber talent. There's no doubt about that. But the fitness is my problem. Can they win a title as the team's currently constituted? No. No, they can't. It's not going to happen. Why not? Why not? And Beat will never be healthy through the playoffs with the right pieces around him. I, I mean, it's just not going to happen. I think he, they get to the second round a few more years 
and then Embiid leaves. Mm. That would be my expectation. Leaves as a free agent, gets traded? Some sort of combo, unhappy superstar move. Mm. I can't be here anymore. It's me or the coach. Um, kind of like, you know, kind of like I expect Giannis might do the same thing at some point. He's going to say, I can't win a championship here. Get me out of here. Mm. I'm hoping for better things, but I hear what you're saying. And, do, do you uh, think he retires a sixer? Uh, well, I, it would be my hope, and he does so with uh, a ring or two rattling around in his drawer at home. But that's just me speaking as a fan and being hopeful. And, um, you know, it, now I could sit back and I have, uh, you know, no duties as a broadcaster whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So I just view it as a fan. And every year I just, you know, watch the Eagles, watch the Sixers, watch the Phils, and watch the Union and hope for the best. By, by the way, the, the Mavs game on Sunday <laughs> gave me some false hope with that. So, uh, you know, right. the fact that they won that game was shocking. I do like Nick Nurse, but I think it's really – it's hard to win titles. I mean, we know that, that. Oh, yeah. I felt like the Phillies were right there. I think sometimes Philadelphia – young fans might be spoiled. Like, oh, what do you mean you can't win a title? It's just really, really hard. Think of that six or seven we started with, the 80s. They could have easily won three titles. They just happened to run into Magic and Bird. Yeah, and I think basketball is kind of unique in this respect. In hockey, you can have the hot goalkeeper. In yeah. baseball, you could be an average hitting team but have great pitching. And you know, football is a one-off. You know, you you yeah. win what you win that one game, and then you can basketball. It's it's a best of seven in the playoffs, and it's talent. It's hard to upset. Mm. It's hard to move on unless you have a strong talent base. Do you agree with me? I totally agree. And also, look at the Nuggets this year. You you don't need just strong talent base. You need two or three really good defenders around him. And the pieces are okay around Embiid, but it, whatever that magic formula, it's not there to me. I have a, one more question. Do you think a big guy – Jokic has done it, but centers have not won titles in recent – I guess Jokic is the exception. Generally, do you remember Tim Duncan would win every year. Then it was Steph and LeBron. Do you need a guy who can hit a three and generate his own offense – uh, that's been a concern of mine. I wonder about style of play in, in Embiid. Right. And I think that's why he's, you know, under Nick Nurse and his system, he's mm. been able to thrive. And I think had he been able to stay healthy, they really would have made a nice regular season run and be able to prep themselves for the playoffs. But, you know, now it's a mood issue because he's hurt. But uh, I like what Nick Nurse did. And listen, you have to conform your coaching now to the way the game is played. And it's all about threes and free throws and layups. And um, I, I think what Nick Nurse did with Embiid was good. I'm just praying that he can come back and they have a shot with him and, you know, can do can perform some kind of miracle in the playoffs. But that's just me speaking as a fan. Yeah, I'm right um, with you. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, back in September, CBS Sports Radio moved you from the afternoons to the mornings. How did, yes. that, affect, how did that affect your life? Uh, so <laughs> a lot less beauty sleep. Uh there was a host named Damon Amanda Laura who moved to Sirius and the, the shift became open and Maggie and I, Maggie, who's an old friend from actually sports illustrated. We volunteered for the morning because honestly we are a morning show. You know, we have a woman host and we have my sensibility, which is a little more humorous, a little less X and O's really lend itself to the morning. A morning show has less sports, a little more fun. And we were, that was exciting to us. It gave us an extra hour, gave us a little more access to sponsors Every, it gave us a bigger team around us. Um, so it was a great opportunity. So I'm older. I don't really do anything exciting at night anyway. <laughs> it, I was like, yeah, I would love to do the morning. The, right. problem, the only challenge is watching sports late at night. And I talked to a few other 6 a.m. guys. You find a way. You wake up early. You watch it on tape. But it's been great. I am definitely a full-on morning show guy. You get the first ch- chance to take, have a take on the story. Uh, you get it out of the way. The energy is there. And as I get older, I'm more of a morning guy. I never was like that. I used to be a night guy. I mean, you've worked nights most of your career. Yeah. So you've had to adjust to the night schedule. But there's something really refreshing about doing it first thing. Yeah. Um, where are we with women in sports, particularly sports yeah. talk? I know now, uh, you know, Kate Scott's come along. She's done an awesome job replacing yeah. me as the TV guy for the Sixers. Are we past the point where, um, you know, X amount of men are going to be blanching and, oh, that's a woman or you know, holding her to a higher standard, all the stuff that we've experienced in years past? Uh, I honestly don't think 
I think we've made huge strides, but I can see it. I do think Maggie gets a different reaction than me. There's always holdouts who are going to be, you know, hold her to a different standard. I can screw up nine sports facts and nobody cares. Maggie says something wrong and somebody sends her a tweet. It's just the way, the way it is. Um, but she is, um, she is, her and I, they're really, you know, to her credit, like you wouldn't really know it's a woman in sports because we have a lot of give and take and she doesn't really, she doesn't care one way or another um, about when we're talking about sports. She doesn't view it as a woman and me view it as a man. She just views it as a sports analyst. So, but it is tougher. I mean, we'd be blind and I'm sure Kate could tell you the same thing. Like, do you do have some holdouts who have some really ugly criticism? Uh, and I see it, like I see it on social media. I'm like, why are you saying that? That's so stupid. Maggie knows a hundred times more sports than you. I can mm-hmm. guarantee that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's been great for me. I mean, I honestly, I don't even really think about it too much because I, luckily I think we have a pretty good rhythm. So we don't focus on that. I mean, the, the funny thing too is I'm, I'm really into Caitlin Clark. I think that story is amazing. And Maggie's like, yeah, it's okay. But I, I, let's talk about LeBron. So is it really yeah. like, <laughs> if you work with somebody long enough, those gender roles tend to dissolve a little bit, I think, which I think is like something to aspire to. But I do think the trend is, I mean, we see more and more, you know, Mina Kimes has broken in to be a premier NFL analyst. Uh, we've seen um, Doris Burke now is pretty much the number one color analyst. So the progress has been great, but there's a lot of room to go. Uh, there's a lot of room to go. Um, yeah, and I, it's interesting I say that about Maggie. It is it is tough. Like, I mean, she really works hard. She's like, I don't want to give anything for any pig-headed guys to come after me for. Um, so she, you know, and she's a lot better than me, so that is easy for her to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, explain Stephen A. Smith, yeah. Pat McAfee, and maybe a couple of others who have really just vaulted way above the crowd and into our constant daily headlines about sports media. Yeah. Well, Stephen A., I remember him as a columnist in the Inquirer. Uh, yeah. It is. He was a beat writer at the Inquirer. He covered the Sixers. I know. I know. It, it was hot. It was, I don't want to say hot take. Opinion, but you, authenticity. You believe Stephen A., for better or worse, you might, anyway. <laughs> I think Stephen A is an act. Nobody can keep up an act this long. He really does. Uh, I think there's an authenticity. Same with Pat. I know Pat pretty well. Uh, not pretty well, but I've known him for a long time. And Pat is Pat. That is not an act. So I think I think one thing that elevated Pat was that weekly Aaron Rodgers interview. And Pat has access because he is a total guy's guy. And if you meet Pat, he is no different as this very famous Pat McAfee than he was as a punter. He is a very genuine guy. So I'm going to credit those two guys with a word I keep on saying, authentic. They kind of who they are, who they are. We can smell out the fakes. And Stephen A, for all his flaws, and I love when sometimes he makes a mistake and people make fun of it, that dude is like, he cannot be faking this all the time. He's really passionate about basketball. I've seen him uh, many NBA games. When I started in the 90s, he was always there. It was not like that guy takes a day off. He's, I think he's a real deal. So you know, there's a couple other guys I won't name names who are famous hot takers who I don't think have been as has had the longevity that, that uh, Stephen A has had because people know they mm-hmm. they know mm-hmm. um, it's just hot takes and not much in the way of a foundation or anything like that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, mean I, unless you start naming names, I, I got to be generic. So, well, Skip Skip Bayless, I think, was at one time a a, a very interesting. Uh, you know, was a good columnist, a good reporter. I think he had some reports that were. Different, but I know Skip Bales drives a lot of people crazy because sometimes you feel like he's not buying his own hot takes. That yeah, that's right. what I think is the issue. Um, he's obviously very talented at what he does, and I remember him very well as a writer. He was a very talented writer. So I think that some people have trouble with him because it seems like hot takes for hot takes' sake. Yeah, right. Uh, Andrew, uh, you're you're lucky like I am. You have the opportunity to watch sports and get paid to do it. Um, What's your advice for somebody who wants to be you or me or anybody in the sports media world? <laughs> um, don't do, if you're more talented than me, don't join the world because I don't need any more competition. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, the the one thing. Just start uh, start writing. I, I really start writing because there's so many places to write now. You can write a post and put it on your Facebook, 
But I think all the people I really like to follow at some point have either written for for themselves, written, published, written for TV. I think that that's a really good way to get into it for me. So start writing. And this is not a new thing, but you got to take you got to try every medium you got. You cannot say, oh, I'm going to be a magazine writer. Oh, I'm going to be on TV nowadays. And then, look at Pat McAfee start out on YouTube. You got to really be smart. So. Guys like me, honestly, I have to turn to the young people and say, where's the audience? Um, but I see that people who are really successful are really nimble. Like they're like, not like, don't be like, I'm going to do it my way because that way is going to be gone in two years. Speaking of the years, uh, do you see yourself at CBS Sports Radio for the rest of your career? Or are there some other things you want to try to accomplish? I, uh, I would, you know, I'd love to say, I love CBS Sports Radio. It's a great crew. Uh, I have great bosses. I would love to do that. I'd like to do more uh, book projects. I, I co-wrote a book. It's going to be completely random, and you're not even going to believe it, with uh, Case Keenum, the former Vikings quarterback, right after the Minneapolis Miracle, and I love that experience. So when time and opportunity present, I'd like to work on more book projects. Um, that's one goal, but I could easily do this for the rest of my career. Uh, wake up every morning and talk sports, interact with fans. I love the fans of our show who call in. It's amazing. I am fully, fully aware of how lucky I am. Well, long may you wave, my friend. Andrew Perloff, thanks so much for being with us on Fresh 24. Thanks, Mark. That was really fun. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. PHLSportsNation.com. Philadelphia Sports Nation. PHL Sports Nation. Enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. 